Welcome to the Passive Income Podcast. Please be sure to join the Passive Income Posse by clicking that, that subscribe button below. Uh, super excited for this episode. Joining me is Financial Fate. Please go ahead and give yourself an introduction. Awesome. Well, so excited to be here, first of all. Um, but my name is Vanessa and I'm the creator of Financial Fate. So this platform is essentially just to help people um, with their financial literacy, to understand finance, to feel comfortable in that environment. Um, we talk about a wide range of topics and that was just, it's kind of a passion project because it was something that I kind of struggled to learn about myself. So I wanted to create a space where um, people, yeah, feel like it's easy and it's fun and digestible. Awesome. I just going to quickly point out as well, everyone knows I am in Canada and you are as well. Um, yes. We're, we're not going to give anyone any much any more information than that. Canada is a big country, so try to come and find us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Team Canada. Let's go. There we go. Um, so I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about uh, the TSX, Toronto Stock Exchange, investing in Canada. Um, I don't know if you do any investing outside of Canada or not, but I, I'm sure we can get into that as well. So. Um, yeah, just kind of going back to your introductory statements about, you know, the financial fate platform and trying to make it fun and interesting and exciting. And for young people, I can, I'm not sure how old you are, but I can tell by looking at you, you're a lot younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was part of the, the, the idea as well, because I think like as a young person kind of diving into the finance industry, there's a couple different ways to do it. And it depends whether you're families may be into it as well, whether you like study at university, whether it's you're just kind of a finance enthusiast. But I think that was something for me um, that I kind of wish I would have done was start it even earlier. I mean, I know, I guess I'm a, a little bit early, but I'm like, time is time is of the essence when it comes to investing or when it comes to like learning these terms and and having sort of a foundation already it was important for me to to go into the finance industry um even not having like studied finance very much in university it was just more of a, a passion of mine i guess right yeah and you know like you said everybody doesn't matter how old people are if they start at you know say 25 which is still quite young to start and they're all like i wish i had started earlier even I've even heard people at, that have started at 20 saying, I wish I had started like at 18 and, you exactly. know, <laughs> so, but it's also never too late to start. Like, you know, if you're 35, that's a great time to start too. Like just get started. I, I've said it so many times, just get started, just get on base, just get going. Yeah. Start with 100%. something. Definitely. And, I even remember, I think I posted something on X where we uh, originally met and, uh, you warmly welcomed me to your uh, passive income posse, which was awesome. Um, I think I posted something like, when's a good time? Or what would you say to somebody that's looking to start their investing journey? And then you you responded that like, start now. Like it's, that's kind of, I think the, the main thing when it comes to investing is no matter how old you are, like whether you start is, is all that makes the difference, right? Right. And I mean, like, even at my age, I'm over 50 and obviously I've been investing for a while, but if, if you're even just starting at 50, right, like that, you've still got 20 years to 70. Sure. You might oh, not, yeah. you might not be able to retire early, but you know, yeah. 20 years is still a, a pretty good chunk of time to be able to, you know, put a, put a bit aside from every paycheck and, and let that compounding effect take place and let that snowball get rolling. Exactly. Exactly. With uh, the help of compound interest on our side, it'll, it makes, it moves mountains no matter what the age. So I think that, yeah, yeah that was something that I kind of wanted to, to make a little bit more accessible. I know a lot of people are doing it as well online, but um, as much as it was to, to educate, I was like, finance is such uh, a huge realm of, of learning opportunities and, and I want to continue learning as well. So this was a fun a fun way to do it and to make connections and to, to learn along the way. Right. Yeah. And then another point I've made too, with other young people who I've had here on as guests on the passive income podcast is mm -hmm. it is so much easier these days. You, you know, just pick up mm -hmm. your phone, download an app and you're set. You have all these resources available for doing your research. You have Google, you have YouTube, you have, you know, company websites, you have, everything is right there at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. 
and it's just so easily accessible now that there's no excuse for anyone not to be doing it and, and especially young people like unfortunately we're all staring at our phones all, all day long every day anyway yeah. right so instead of just you know randomly scrolling through instagram or or the other parts of twitter that <laughs> we won't get into <laughs> but um right like it, it's just you know, you know make make better use of that time that you're staring at your phone right is i yeah. guess my point there it's so easy to get distracted or like go on different tangents of like screen scrolling or anything. But I think, yeah, if you can delegate that time to to learning about something or get addicted to like the the process of, of evolving and learning in that growth mindset, then I think it can be such a valuable tool to be like living in an age with all this technology. But it really depends like how you spend your time and being mindful of it and yeah. Right. I was even reading, I'm really into books and I was reading the psychology of money and kind of a little bit about how Warren Buffett uh, started and like his investing journey. I'm like, how? Like back in the day, would you, I mean, I'm pretty used to doing it on my laptop or on my phone, but the, the whole concept of investing, I don't know, is something I want to learn more about how he actually did it. Like, did you just go to the bank and that's how, that's how it worked, but it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, uh, back then you actually had to pick up the rotary dial phone and, and yeah. call a stockbroker. Exactly. Yeah. It's very cool. It's very cool. But but yeah, it's just come a long way. So I think however you can get into it, there's there's no wrong answer, right? Right. And you did also allude to the point about us meeting on X uh, relatively recently. You're quite new on X. And yes. I shout out to you. I, I saw you. You had about 97 followers and I read like sort of at the time your last 10 or say 15 posts and i was like oh wow this is so i i clicked follow and then so you're at 98 and then you were like can we get to 100 so that's when we kind of really became a, a little more connected because I, exactly. I gave you a pretty good shout out there i'm like you were like um can we hit hit 100 by june and i'm like this was what may 26 or 7th or whatever yeah, end of may and i'm like it. let's just do it right now yeah <laughs> I was like, let's go, Dave. So yeah, then uh, with your help, got to 100. And then from there, it's been like a fun snowballing effect of, of just meeting more people and learning through them and and kind of wanting to be a sponge in the space too. Because there's people that I chat with like yourself that, that talk about dividends. And I'm like, okay, I know a little bit, but I definitely haven't spent a bunch of time specifically setting dividends um, or whether it's, I don't know, crypto or just the the mass yeah. the mass different spectrums of finance so it's been a really cool place to get to meet people and chat yeah well de you're definitely welcomed into the community and you're gonna your account's gonna grow like crazy you're gonna be up to a thousand followers before you know it because mm -hmm. uh you do put out some really quality content and some great posts so it, it's not gonna have it's gonna be really fast for you to to grow that account i can guarantee that mm -hmm. um <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. That is an interesting point, though, sort of about, you know, the different types of investing, whether, whether you were, a, you know, more like myself. At, and again, it's partially because of my age, right? Dividend, I'm looking for that to grow that passive income so that in, say, 10 years when I do retire, that I have just money rolling in every month and every yeah. quarter. And, you know, somebody uh, your age, younger, you may want to look more into, into growth stocks. So, mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, I don't think there's anything wrong with young people investing in dividends either. I think, yeah. and again, not financial advice, but you know, younger people in their twenties probably really should be looking at sort of a balance between growth stocks and dividend stocks, right? And just yeah, that, that's my opinion. If if I were to do it over again, if I was in my mid twenties, that's exactly the way I would do it. Um, yeah, I don't know what it's your thoughts are there. Yeah, I think I think dividends are an amazing tool. And I'm I'm kind of I was surprised I took because I was interested in finance and and stocks. I think stocks were like the gateway of me learning about finance. Um, I took a stocks course and they never really went over dividends. And then I was kind of looking That's through. Surprising. <laughs> I know I, I ended up finding dividends and researching it more on my own. And um, I thought what? what a like useful way to, to invest into stocks and to grow your portfolio. So um, yeah, I definitely agree with having a little bit of versatility and like growth stocks, dividend stocks, kind of in, in investing in general, like a little bit of 
everything to diversify your portfolio, I think really will work wonders. I hope still new, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, and again, like I said, the nice thing about dividends is, you know, pretty well every single month and especially on, you know, on the quarters that are the, the big bumps, there's just more cash sitting there in your brokerage account to then reinvest. Yeah. So you can just buy more shares. So the next time it rolls around, you're getting more dividends to buy more exactly. shares again. And it's just like, exactly that snowball just keeps growing and growing. So um, yeah. that's why I'm sold on it. And yeah, I think that's, you know, obviously why a lot of dividend investors are sold on the idea is just the cash just keeps coming. Mm -hmm. I like cash. Yeah. Who doesn't? <laughs> exactly. Who doesn't like a little passive income? I think, yeah, it's it's crucial nowadays to have some sort of passive income or a side hustle. Or I think, yeah, when you when you look at inflation or the price of groceries, you're like, OK, maybe maybe there's a little uh, an opportunity to do more than just my nine to five or, or at least I think there should be. So whatever your interest is, there's there's a lot to learn about it. Definitely, for sure. Mm hmm. You've mentioned crypto a few times and I've seen you post about crypto as well. So you're obviously a little bit into the crypto space. Yes. What are your yeah, thoughts there? Primarily one. Bitcoin, just uh, stick with the big guy or? <laughs> yeah, I try to. Again, as well? again, I try to like, I guess my keyword is diversification. Like I um, got into crypto. My boyfriend was very into crypto. So that was something that I kept hearing about. And I'm like, okay, it's kind of like scary. Like, what is this? What is this realm of crypto and digital currencies and, and different types of assets? But um, yeah, I think the more that I looked into it and kind of looked at like Solana, or like XRP and dived into like a little bit, I'm such a research buff. So I'm like, okay, I have to know the depths of what these, what these blockchains are doing or, or what these currencies are doing. So I think um, that was something that I just started researching and, and looking more into. And then there's so many different webs of, of crypto as well. So if you look at like Solana, for instance, within Solana, you have like meme coins and, and that's another crazy um, type of currency. I, I explain it for back of, lack of a better word, like stocks on crack, because the amount that the charts move per second, if somebody drops a meme coin, um, it's pretty wild, but I think long term that's not necessarily my play. But um, I think investing more in like the the stable coins, um, whether it's Solana or XRP, and kind of letting it be a waiting game and just diversifying that crypto portfolio. Um, but yeah, there's definitely rabbit holes within each that are interesting to learn about. Um, Again, not financial advice. None of this is. It's just, um, just to chat about it. But, but yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, realm of finance that's coming up. Yeah. Full disclosure: I own what may be considered too much XRP, and it's just like I wish you would do something. Yeah. Like, Come on, please. Like, yeah, but like everything point. else. Like you mentioned, Solano skyrocketed at one point. Car uh, Cardano, ADA had a good yeah. run. Um, exactly. And I XRP, know. just please do something someday. <laughs> I know. I'm hopeful. I'm really hopeful with, with Ripple to pull through. So I think there's they've got to see, you know, the competition and what's happening. And I think um, I feel like they're still solid. So, yeah, I'm holding. I'm holding. But, um, yeah, Solana has done some crazy, some crazy movement lately. Kind of off, well, sort of on topic with Solana. Did you see the, the guy yesterday? That had Solano tattooed to his forehead. I did. I did. I'm. I'm not sure who it was. Um. I didn't see sure the either, name. But like, that seems crazy. Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Dedicated to the cause. Maybe he bought it at like Sense or something. But uh, it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be me getting a tattoo of Solano on my forehead. That's not not, sure. not, I'm not gonna get anything tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I know. I know the crypto world, but. I yeah, guess if you're an crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I'm sure it was a rapper or something. But. <laughs> All right, let's get back into sort of, um, you know, Can we're, let's talk a little bit about Canada, Canadian stocks and, yeah. and sectors. Is there anything that you really like looking at as far as, you know, obviously Canadian banks are very popular among the, the um, Twitter community or the X community and, yeah. you know, oil and gas, in Canada is is a big sector. Um, mm -hmm. 
the telecoms have had quite the downward slide. Both Bell and Telus are down quite a bit over the last year or so. Yeah. Um, I don't know, any sectors that you kind of focus on or look at or you just yeah, I think I, I, I from there and see, what, see where, yeah, where we definitely. go. I think um, that's a great question. I still try to like maintain some diversification in, within my portfolio. I don't necessarily stick to one sector. Maybe that would be um, something to look forward to in the future. But I think in terms of like Canadian stocks, um, the Canadian Railway was something that I've been looking at um, for quite some time. Um, I have a little list here. Suncor, obviously, um, some banks, Manulife, and then um, Shopify, not necessarily, like, was something that um, I was fairly early on, which was exciting, but that has taken some up and downs <laughs> recently. So um, I, I guess I'm mostly, like, I do find tech quite interesting, but um, I think some of those Canadian staple stocks are like important and, and um, in producing dividends too. Those were some that I want to focus on um, the Canadian ones in that matter. Nice. Uh, you mentioned the railways there. I don't think you've been, we've been following each other long enough for you to know about my train tweets. No, I don't think so. You'll have to enlighten me, Dave. Okay. Well, after we're done recording later today, I will, uh, I'll, I'll make some train tweets and tag you. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I'll be uh, looking out for you. I do not own any of the uh, like Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian National or Canadian Pacific, but yeah, uh, I basically I live right by the train tracks. A lot of people know that, and so I just post videos and pictures of them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get in that stock at some point, then, Dave. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. <laughs> That's awesome. They're very cool. Yeah. So yeah, you, you mentioned a few like Suncor. Uh, I own some Suncor. That's you know done well. Yeah. Um, another one. There's a guy on Twitter that bugs me all the time about buying Termaline or Termaline. Oh yeah, yeah. And so I have picked up a few shares almost just to satisfy that person. <laughs> just be like, okay, <laughs> I got some check. shares. I got yeah. it. They're just they're probably just looking out for you. They're like, you gotta jump on this now. Yeah. No, but I think the Canadian oil and gas sector. Um, is sometimes overlooked. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, most people in Canada that are investors know about it and and are not overlooking it. But, you know, outside of Canada, obviously, too, it's difficult too. you know, when I have a lot of American viewers and followers, obviously, and mm. it, it's tough to to convince them to invest in Canada, because like, they've got so many great companies there in, in the US yeah. to invest in to begin with, right. So, mm. and I get it too, right. Like, and again, Canadians all probably should be looking at US companies too. I know, the only reason I don't have any U.S. companies in my portfolio is just simply the exchange rate. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's the big one. If the Canadian dollar ever went back up to say 85 cents, then it would be a lot more uh, manageable to mm -hmm. to buy. Yeah, I, that's definitely like a downfall of the stock market. I think for us looking at uh, the U.S. market, and and I've gotten into a couple, um, Tesla being one of them, which I look back now and I'm like, hmm. I don't know. I think at, at the time it was it was something that I was excited to to put in. I'm hoping that that stock goes up because that was something that uh, bought was bought higher than than planned. Um, but I think yeah, that exchange rate is just something that is the pitfall of of really wanting to join in on those stocks and get those benefits yeah. and follow those companies. So I don't yeah, know. The, it is a bit of a killer right now, right at mm -hmm. seventy three cents or something. So. Yeah, it does really put put a lot it's, of the U.S. out of yeah. reach for for a lot of Canadians, and it's, and then you go back to well, why would I pay seventy three cents on the dollar for a U.S. stock when I could pay a dollar on the dollar for a Canadian stock? That's exactly, kind of it's so true, right. and it almost comes down to like as I was researching finance, so much of that information um, initially was from the U.S. I was like, okay, it's, it's interesting to, to obviously learn about those stocks, but, but I'm in Canada. So I need to kind of switch this information to whether it's stocks to the Canadian market, or, I mean, obviously you can still go on the, the American market, but even like investing, um, long-term or like RSPs, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing a lot about 401ks, but I need a Canadian. It mean, yeah, it means nothing to us, really, right? Yeah, so this means nothing to me. Or, or your Roth IRA. I'm like, okay, 
what's the equivalent? Um, and then you learn about your TFSA and then, yeah, it just becomes a snowball effect. But I think it's so much easier when you do that first Google search um, to get like almost American information and you have to kind of dig through the weeds to find that Canadian specific stuff, unless you want to go on like the right. CRA website. And then that's like <laughs> digesting that information is a whole other ball game. So it's, it's not fun, but um, yeah. The CRA website in itself is not fun. No, <laughs> it's no. It's not a fun website. <laughs> it's just like text on a white screen and, and uh, yeah, you're trying to focus as best as you can on, on what they're telling you, but it's, it's fairly dry. So, and that was something I guess um, created this passion for learning in general was I wanted to make it fun and it can be fun and, and uh, the information doesn't need to be so hard to access. Right. Uh, just for our viewers outside of Canada, the CRA is the Canadian Revenue Agency, which is uh, basically similar or the same thing as, as the IRS in the U.S., just the where, yeah. where you pay your taxes to kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Or where you file your tax return with, with uh, yes. Canada Revenue Agency. Definitely. Um, yeah. So I don't know. What other, you know, other sectors? You, I kind of touched on the telecoms there. Any thoughts on Bell, Telus, Rogers, Quebec or... Yeah, I think I, I've been looking at Rogers a little bit and Bell, but telecom's not necessarily something that I've like zoned in on all that much. Um, yeah, I guess Mace, essentially just like a little bit of tech looking at diversification as a whole and, and uh, playing that game for, for right now. Right. Mm. Uh, the big one, Canadian banks, I know we, we mentioned it there briefly, but, uh, you know, dividend paying for nearly 200 between 150 and 200 years depending on which bank you're looking at so obviously i'm a big fan of that that the longevity that the history mm -hmm. of that dividend payment um obviously canadian banks are very strong financial institutions very much more regulated in canada than than in the us we basically have five or six big banks whereas mm -hmm. in the us they literally have thousands of regional banks so big mm -hmm. difference there in the in the banking so I don't know, what are your thoughts on on the Canadian banks? Yeah, I think um, definitely a strong foundation um, for longevity, like you were saying. Um, I kind of tried to look at the these stocks in um, in unison with like my own personal goals as well. So I'm like, okay, how how are these banks actually doing institutionally? What are their goals? Um, what are they offering people right now? Whether it comes down to like I guess another realm of finance, like credit cards or like what people, what perks people are looking at. Um, so I try to kind of base my purchases within the stock market um, alongside my, my personal decisions as to like what would be successful long term or, or what it would give um, the consumer. Um, but I think I found TD to obviously be quite strong. Um, BMO, Royal Bank, like they're all, they're all, they all have their own, I guess, strengths um, and weaknesses. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it depends for me what they're, what the company is actually doing in itself and like how they're wanting to help the consumer. Cause it's great that like the banks can, can be this strong foundation for, for Canadians, but it's also important to, to be like, okay, what am I actually getting? Or like, how are these banks actually helping the consumer? Whether it's like, the the evolution of interest rates or or credit cards um so i think yeah what the consumer can get out of it is kind of what i'm more focused on yeah you mentioned td there and a couple of weeks ago really created a buying dip uh with that whole anti-money yeah. laundering thing that, that was, was going crazy on yeah yeah very crazy but, you know it was yeah. great all of a sudden it, the stock was ten dollars cheaper. It's like, go ahead and buy some more, right? Yeah, exactly. Buy low. We buy low. So, so yeah, it was a great opportunity for investors. Terrible for for the company in itself, but but yeah, an investing, an opportunity. Uh, before we move on to the other big news this week in the banks was the National Bank buying Canadian Western. What are your mm. thoughts there? I think that's big news, think... right? That that. I think that bumps national into the top five and and might like push CIBC or Scotiabank to, to number six. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, again, an opportunity, an opportunity for investors if you get in there early and are looking at that information. So another, yeah, another major headline, I'd say. Yeah, I think it's great news. Uh, great news, for I think, for both uh, Canadian Western investors and obviously national bank investors as well. So mm -hmm. I think that's, I think it was just quite solid all around. Yeah, exactly. Good time to buy. <laughs> Good time to buy. Um, yes. I'm going to share some screens here. I've got, I found your YouTube channel. Oh, okay. We'll dive into that. It's new, but uh, hopefully there'll be some more. It's content. very new. I noticed that I just started a month or so ago. Yes. Um, yes. I think um, there I'd like to essentially create some more longer form videos explaining things um, of interest, whether it's, investing opportunities or budgeting hacks. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, so um, I will link this in the description below and just be sure to come over here. I saved doing this for the recording session. Just come oh, over here. Dave, oh, just, just click right there. See how easy that was. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> uh, but you just have a few videos up and yeah, yeah it's, it's a start. Which is awesome. Everybody starts somewhere. Even Mr. Beast started at zero subscribers, right? And exactly. Well past that. Like you said, so. Mr. Mr. Beast is is the goal. Or what did we say? Have an interview with Mr. Beast. Yeah. Something like that. You were like, what's a what's some advice for starting YouTube? I'm like, just have a collab with Jimmy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah, working on like, it. Okay. Working <laughs> on it. Next step, Mr. Beast. <laughs> but yeah, so. yeah, something new for sure. And I guess definitely what I would say to you too is YouTube is a grind. So, you know, yeah. and you'll have your ups and downs. You'll get frustrated, but just don't give up, right? It's the same as everything yeah. else in life. Just don't give up. You know, I'm a long way away too from where I'd like to be at this point in my yeah. YouTube journey. But hey, I'm not giving up. I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still making these, uh, you exactly. know, I'm still talking to people about, you know, investing and finance and everything. Mm -hmm. And we're having fun. I, I love having the conversations. I love doing the, the live streams. So definitely. Why I would I stop doing, doing something? That... Yeah. In creating such, like, I think you've been able to create such a cool community, honestly, Dave. And like, whether it's dividends or, or just the people that you chat with on your channel, like there's so much knowledge there. So I would yeah. say, yeah, please keep going. You have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It, it has been uh, great bringing the community together. You know, every single guest that I've had on, on the passive income podcast has I've met them through X and through the yeah. uh, investing community on X. And mm -hmm. so it's just, you know, I've had so many people say the exact same thing about, you know, bringing the community together and getting yeah. people to, you know, see each other more than just words on a screen from them, like 100, 280 characters in a, in a post on X, uh, yeah. as opposed to, you know, really getting to have a conversation and, and hearing what people have to say. And yeah, there's, again, because there's been so many different people, you know, dividend uh, investors, growth strategy investors, options traders, uh, mm -hmm. real estate investors. Like there's, like I said, I'm, I think somewhere around 150 different people that have been on now. And so there's a lot of different backgrounds and knowledge and, uh, you know, basically a lot of great content to, for people to go and it's a great resource for people to go and just listen to other people's stories and see how, how they've done it or what they're doing. Exactly. I was listening to the options trader one this morning. I think it was one of your most recent and like just a, such a fascinating conversation. Um, and it's such so interesting to like dive into a topic that someone knows so well inside and out and, and be able to provide some insights for everyone. So, um, yeah, I think it's a very unique channel. And I think X is quite unique in itself, too. There's there's a lot of people that want to learn and, and just connect and and grow. So I found that to be wonderful. Ah, and there's X. <laughs> yeah, speaking of X, here is your, I, I will put this link in the description as well. So be sure to go and follow at Financial Fate on X. So there you are again. There I am. <laughs> yes, hopefully just a hub to, to allow people to learn about finance, to make it a little bit less intimidating, to have fun conversations like this and, and just grow some knowledge I'm sure this will be at 300 by the time uh, this is uploaded, but let's uh, let's get you up to 500 here real fast. <laughs> let's do it. Woohoo! Awesome. 
Awesome. What else do we have to talk about in investing? Yeah, I guess in investing, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty into like reading investing books as well. And like adding investing into your budgeting or I think finance as a whole is, is, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different chat, things to chat about. I guess, where would you want us to take it, Dave? Well, I guess just going back to sort of what I just mentioned, all these different guests and different uh, strategies, opinions, and, you know, lives and journeys and paths that everyone has uh, talked to me about over the last mm -hmm. nearly two years now. And uh, real estate, I, I mentioned there just briefly, and you're at that stage being a young person that, maybe you've already gotten into real estate or you're thinking about getting into real estate and mm -hmm. real estate in Canada. You know, we always hear about how ridiculous, ridiculously expensive Toronto and Vancouver are and to a lesser extent, mm -hmm. the other bigger cities, Calgary and Ottawa, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on, on real estate, real estate investing, getting your, getting into the market? Yeah. I love real estate. Honestly, I find it so fascinating. It's, it isn't something that I've specifically got into myself yet, but that's in the works. Um, I think it definitely depends on the city that you're in in Canada it will depend kind of how, like you're saying, whether you're in Vancouver or Toronto, um, the buying power is obviously different. So um, getting a little bit of exposure into every province, I have some family like in Ontario and Calgary and Vancouver. Um, you get to know the markets firsthand, I feel like a little bit better. Um, so kind of depends, I guess. I'd, I'd like to buy in the near future here. And, and the only thing I guess potentially holding me back would be um, the opportunity of wanting to go and travel right now. So it's kind of that instant gratification or do you use it as a form of passive income and rent it out. Um, that's another thing that's kind of on my mind as well. But yeah, I think even the market within Alberta, BC, they're they're drastically different. So it kind of depends on where you you want to stay and where you feel like it's most viable. Um, right. But the real estate market is so fun. I feel like it's yeah, yeah, it's a great experience to be a part of. Well, even just within either of those provinces, right? Like. Vancouver in the lower mainland compared to Prince George, totally different real estate or, oh, 100%. or, in, or in Alberta, like Calgary and Edmonton, totally different than, than Grand Prairie or something. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So it really depends on where you are and, and where you want to be or where you see yourself in a couple of years. So I think, yeah, buying, buying in Alberta would be cool because in comparison to, to BC or maybe lower mainland specifically, um, the housing prices are crazy there. Um, but yeah, I kind of believe like the, the houses that you walk by and they're like, oh, yeah, that's 3 million. And it just looks like a little duplex. And then you go to Alberta. Yeah, a normal like, bungalow. Like, <laughs> yeah, nothing crazy. You're not even like, you can't see the ocean or anything, but they still market at three point whatever. Yeah, like some random place in North Vancouver is just crazy expensive right yeah exactly i call it the ocean tax i'm sure a lot of people do too but yeah. it's yeah you you pay for you pay for being close to the ocean and i guess close to the mountains in itself like it's a beautiful place to be but um yeah, yeah. i didn't find grocery prices i know a lot of like there's a lot of different thoughts on vancouver versus alberta specifically um and like i don't i think the biggest difference is just the housing costs i'd say yeah for sure it is I it's say. doable but it's it's a lot yeah and then you look at some of the places in in west van or in point gray that are like eight and ten million or and, and above and you're just like yeah oh, that's a 15 million dollar water waterfront property in west exactly van exactly like, i was walking by kitts beach i don't know a couple months ago and and saw a for sale sign we're like, oh, let's let's just see. Let's just Google kind of what what the cost would be of this guy. And I think it was something like maybe a two two bedroom, one bath, four mil, because it was right by Kids Beach. It yeah. was nuts. But I mean, people are buying them, so yeah, that's... Some, they, somebody's got somebody from somewhere has the money. It's yeah, funny. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I do think a, a home is is a good investment in itself and. I know there's kind of that debate asset or liability, um, but I think if you're able to buy it within your means, um, 
I think a house is a great investment. Yeah. So my thoughts on that, because I think is the house itself is the asset. The yeah. mortgage is the liability. And yeah. Like, because the mortgage is the debt. So you're yeah. servicing that debt by paying it, whether whatever, bi-weekly, monthly, however you pay your, your mortgage. Yeah. And so over time, you're increasing the value of your asset being the house and mm -hmm. decreasing the liability of the mortgage. So exactly. my answer to that lifelong debate or Twitter long debate is that <laughs> yeah. it's both. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. It's true. It, until I it's paid off. Yeah, until it's paid off. Then I think it's a, com it's a complete asset once it's paid off. Um, but then in itself, I guess I heard this interesting point also come from that came from X that was um, a house versus a home and, and how the the house in itself is, is seen as an asset because that's like your property and everything. But within the home, there's so many little liabilities, like whether there's maintenance that's unexpected or whether there's I don't know, a natural disaster or something like like that's kind of the liability part, I yeah. feel like, um, aside from whether you're buying it outside of your means or not. Um, but once you do have the complete home ownership, I definitely see it more as, as an asset in itself. For sure. And you're right. There are, you know, these hidden costs of home 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 ownership, like mm -hmm. if a tree fall, a dead tree falls and goes through your roof, that's on you. Right. Yeah, exactly. You can't call yeah. the land if you're renting you just call the landlord and it's his problem so exactly yeah and i feel like there's a lot of skew towards um within the media as well where people are saying like young people just want to rent they want to rent for the rest of their lives and they don't want to own anything but i think it's almost like you see that it's potentially even more difficult maybe and um to buy a home now and and yeah. I think that's what young people want. At least a lot of them that are in my circle are like, okay, I mean, I see all of these condos going up and I could rent for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, but essentially like, I just want to be able to buy it. I want to have that asset. I want to have that home base and, and um, not have to ask my landlord whenever I want to put something up or if I want to paint, you know, a room. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and the other big thing there too is like, say whatever, 20, 25, even 30 years now, the mortgage is paid off or, or over the course of that time, you're paying it down and you're building that equity. If you're paying rent, you're just paying rent for that 20 years, right? Like mm -hmm. at the end of the 20 years, you have, there's nothing to show for it. Whereas exactly. the house that you, that you purchased, yeah. you, you can exactly. sell the house, you can, you know, move to Thailand, whatever. Yeah, yeah it's true. <laughs> I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. I think it works for a lot of people. It really depends on your own financial situations. I think you got to like assess, sit down with yourself and be like, okay, what can I actually afford? What do I want to do? Maybe somebody that's an entrepreneur and, and really is just looking to build their business right now isn't focused on the house. And they're like, I'd rather have my landlord come in and, and fix the things that need to be fixed. And I focus on building and that's okay for me. And then maybe when, when that uh, business is hopefully successful, they're able to to buy that property that they want. So I don't know, it's, it's a mixed bag. And I think it really just depends on where you're at and, and what you're well, looking for. Yeah, I can't agree more. It is a mixed bag because you're seeing more and more reports now saying how it's, it's less expensive to rent than, than to own just mm -hmm. like dollar to dollar. Whereas yeah. it used to always be okay, sure, you had to save up whatever 20 50 grand for a down payment. But then the mortgage payment was always less than rent anywhere. Yeah, but yeah, now exactly. it's kind of going the other way, where mortgage payments are actually more than than rent payments. So it's like, yeah, yeah. I I, I can see that part of the debate for for younger people like yourself. Like, why would I pay more? If exactly. I don't have to? Yeah, yeah. It's pay true. more for right. more headaches. So, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think whether you're paying and and are able to like, if you have a significant other that can also help lower that cost of your mortgage payment or um, yeah, I guess it depends on your situation. Like I keep kind of saying, but um, what I think, what was it the other day? I think it was two days ago. I was looking at like properties, um, Alberta, BC, a little bit of Ontario, just, just for fun, but yeah. I'm mostly stuck in like Alberta and BC. And, and there was this one apartment in Alberta and I was like, okay, um, more of like a house person. I'd rather have like a detached home, but let's see what this apartment is. And, and it was a two bedroom, one bath. And I think it was about maybe like 
400,000 approximately, maybe like 490 or something like yeah. that. But then it's like, it's always condo fees, whether you're in an apartment or something. So you scroll down and you look at the condo fees and it was like $800 a month in condo fees. And then we went through the mortgage calculator and it was about, I say, I think five, maybe it was 5%, let's say 10% just for fun, it was $2,500 a month plus then your, your uh, condo fees. Um, so you're like, okay, I'm looking at like three grand to um, put towards a mortgage of this apartment every month. So it's just, it's, it's crazy numbers. And I think obviously it depends on like how new the property is, where you're looking, the area, the province. Um, but the numbers are, yeah, they're, they're kind of spooky to see sometimes in, in comparison to renting. So, yeah, that's, that is insane. That is an yeah. insane amount of money to be. Yeah. You know, and, and sort of what you said, it goes back to each person's individual, uh, you know, personal finance is personal. And, mm -hmm. and so everybody is different. So may, there's people out there that can, can afford that three grand a month exactly. just to go to just to go to their housing costs and it's like yeah you know yeah, you've got a lot of other bills on top of that too right <laughs> it's true and i guess like it does look at what your what your priorities are whether it's um that you want to stay in a certain city and you want to build and and have that property and, and not think about it or whether you're i don't know you have to travel a lot for work or you know um want to build a business it's it really just depends on and so many different factors, but yeah, some people have uh, 3k that they're ready to just um, put into their house every month, but it depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so just for context, um, my area is a lower cost of living. I have a, mm -hmm. a house. I've got about a, at least half acre, close to three quarters of an acre lot. Um, so I'm going out to mow the lawn later this afternoon, like I do every nice. Saturday. Yeah, know, I see your <laughs> pictures on X. I'm like, that's a lot of grass. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot to mow. <laughs> um, the house, technically it's called a four bedroom, uh, but upstairs is just two rooms. Like it's, so it's a one and a half story type of house. Yeah. Uh, so on the main floor, two bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, a living room, just mm -hmm. a normal house. Yeah. And when I bought it two years ago now, it was, pretty much it was literally the lowest price house in the whole area <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and two years ago was at the time when everybody was um uh, selling for over asking price mm -hmm. i got this house at the time they were asking 449 i got it for 40 grand below asking i got it for four oh, wow. wow that's amazing that's wild yeah yes. and luckily from the the sale of my previous house i had a really good chunk to to be able to put on put down on the down payment so yeah um, that's amazing. that made the mortgage obviously a lot less and exactly and like seeing the opportunities right it's like time of the market time of like where you are at in life as well whether like a house sale is successful there's, there's a lot of things but yeah. but that's amazing congrats yeah so that was so the other house we had lucked out my ex-wife and i and that's why that we had to sell the house because we were getting divorced but we bought the house for 260 or 270 it was a 13 mm -hmm. acre hobby farm that we got for 260 or 275 or something like that yeah and it sold for like five years later just because the real estate went absolutely crazy mm -hmm. we sold it five years later for 650 or something like that yeah yeah it's wild so, yeah. yeah. And that's just the way real estate works, right? Is every so year that it goes crazy and, and things double in price or more than double in price. Exactly. Exactly. And even within my area, like I, I noticed that as well, where like a duplex or, or um, like a fair, like a, a large detached home would be like a million or something yeah. easily. Like it just, the, the market just skyrocketed in the last couple of years too. And, and even developers coming in and buying these, um detached single detached homes and making a fourplex on the property or that's something that's um exploded here so yeah well yeah. And again it's location right the way i just described my house and the way we were talking about the lower mainland or and north vancouver in particular because yeah. this would kind of fit in a place like north vancouver it yeah. would be a two or three million dollar property and it's just yeah. all about location yeah. right it's true so. it's true it's all about location but but yeah, still, still a great steal, and and you saw the opportunity. So, 
amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. <laughs> Well, it feels like we could keep talking and talking about, well, real estate specifically there. We got on a little bit of a... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Who knew we were both so excited about real estate? I love that. Yeah. I'm actually, uh, I've got an idea in, uh, brewing in the back of my head and I'm going to make a video about it and post it as well. So uh, I'll, I'll make sure you see that. Yeah, people, I'll be looking up for it. A few people kind of know the idea and I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to just make a video and and pop it up there and see what uh see what people think of my exactly. idea i might be crazy i, I probably <laughs> am crazy <laughs> <laughs> to be creative you got to be a little crazy so yeah right, Give right. yeah yeah <laughs> awesome. awesome well before we sign off i just want to give you another opportunity anything else you'd like to talk about or touch on or shout out to anything I think, first of all, just thank you for having me on. Um, it's been awesome to chat and to actually get to put a face to the Twitter profile and and uh, to, yeah, have a cool conversation. So I'm excited to, like, keep the chatting going. Um, and in terms of financial fate, just come hang out if you want to learn um, a different, bunch of different realms about finance. And we'll dive into budgeting and different forms of investments and credit cards and, and just the whole realm of, of, uh, of finance, making it digestible and fun. And I'm excited to see where it goes. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here. That was awesome. I, I am going to, I did. So when we were scrolling there on your Twitter profile, X profile, and that yeah. video, you talked about using credit cards for points, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You didn't make the most important point, which is to make sure you pay it off every month. Yes. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Sometimes I'm like, is that not a given? But I guess it's true. It's, yeah. it's, it's the biggest part. You really do have to make sure that first of all, it's on time. You're making your payments um, in full if you can. And uh, yeah, making sure that you don't have any unnecessary fees. That's a big one. Yeah. You definitely do not want to get hit with that 20% uh, interest no. on a credit card. No, I think credit cards, they can be such a useful tool if you're you're very like intentional with them. Um, I think it's important to obviously mind your budget in unison and, and make sure that you're only spending what you have. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, with that said, thank you again so much for being here. I truly appreciate your time. It's, like you said, awesome to have a chat with you, get to know you a little bit better. And I will... Uh, obviously keep following you on X, keep watching your, your progress and your growth. And, you know, like I said, just keep grinding with that YouTube channel and, you know, you'll, you'll gain more subscri subscribers guaranteed. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, excited for future chats and, and can't wait to see where yours grows as well. So amazing. Oh yeah. You're coming back next weekend for the live, aren't you? I will be there. Yes. I'm excited to meet awesome. your posse as well. So this will yeah. be very cool. <laughs> the lives are so much fun because you get like a group of people just chatting with each other. You get comments in the chat. And so you, yeah. you know, people respond yeah. to to the interaction with the viewers. And it's the, the live streams are an absolute ton of fun. Yeah, it's, so, it's very yeah. exciting. And I think I don't think I've actually ever spoken in a live yet because I'm very new on X. So I think this will be very cool. It'll be a nice, cool first experience at it. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Thanks. if you're still watching at this point, please beg me, please be sure to hit that subscribe button below and join the passive income posse today. Ooh. <laughs>